Hello friends, uh, very good evening to all of you. For few it might be good morning or good afternoon. Uh, today I have uh, Donna Jones uh, with me. She is from Canada. And Donna has been uh, presented session with us before also. It's a second session uh, with this Discuss Agile Network. Today she will be telling us how to work uh, constructively with apparent conflicts and issues in team and in the organization as well. So uh, before we move forward, Donna, I would request you to tell us something more about yourself. So if somebody is listening to you for the first time, they can know more about you. Oh, thank you, Billy, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It, my joke has often been that um, whenever you put the word conflict in the title of anything, people avoid it. So uh, the fact that you've shown up at all is a is a mark that or an indicator that you're ready. It's it's more sophisticated information we're going to be talking about today. My work has been in organizing, uh, facilitating leadership evolution and development and, and organizational change, and, and at the wider scale, I'm looking at things globally. And of course, what that does is it takes me into teams as well. So I, I started working with really tense situations in the early 90s. And I'll share some of those with you throughout the uh, the conversation this morning or the, this evening for you. So again, thank you for <laughs> coming <laughs> so late in the day. It's 7 o'clock in the morning at my end and, and late for you. So I, I really appreciate it. At any rate, uh, my, yeah, so that's been my journey. I've written uh, Decision Making for Dummies, which is a more sophisticated handbook for decision making. I've also got a chapter in The Intelligence of the Cosmos by Irvin Laszlo, who was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's on deep dynamics in organizations, emotion in the workplace, and self-organizing, and the purpose of business, the higher purpose of business. And then we've got a new book coming out with a team of people, um, which is key to high performance, and my chapter in there is about workplace health, and uh, very much how co companies are creating costs by ignoring workplace health. So, you know, having fun writing and uh, glad, delighted to be here again. Thanks, Bailey. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Donna. So we can move ahead with the slides and uh, just one. Let me get started. Uh, just I just finished presenting at the Mob Programming Conference in for Agile New England in Boston, and this was the title or something kind of similar to it because one of the things work coaching uh, agile coaches, but also we're working in with organizational dynamics, which is my my strength and my skill set, is that whenever you put agile into an organization that is designed for stability, it has a tendency to uh, freak out. It has a tendency to, to disrupt things in a big way. And the, the temptation is always to to respond the way we've always done, which is to go back to more of a command control style that we just tell them, if we just explain it to them, then they'll get, they'll understand and we can move forward. But unfortunately, that's not how the human brain works. So what I want to do with you today is give you the conceptual back. I want to, I want you to look at energy differently. So we're going to start with that. And I want you to look at conflict differently, I should say, as energy. And, and we'll start with that. And then uh, I'm going to ask you to bring forward by about slide seven, with the help of PLA, I'm going to ask you to bring forward issues that you're seeing, and then I'll translate them into your environment. So let's get started. So when I was working in the 90s with national policy issues in Canada, there were some very challenging times with that. And I realized that conflict was being seen as a negative. It was seen as a force that you had to resolve, you had to fix it. But in nature, that is not how it works. In nature, uh, when water meets land, when when water... It, it, it changes the landscape, and, and of course, th that is um, a conflict, but it's, it's a constructive conflict. It's a constructive way of, of working with change. And so we realized that a lot of conflict was about perception and how we see it. And related to that, when I was working with a, a uh, well, actually, I got a phone call to go in and work with a team, and they said, look, you know, we, we've, we, we've got a two-and-a-half-day strategy session set up. We've never made it past the half day before 10 o'clock in the morning on the first day before there's been what they said was blood on the floor, which to my way of understanding meant things just went bad. And so, you know, if you can get us through the first day or get us to the end, we'd be thrilled. 
so that was my challenge. Now, I'd already been working with a lot of conflict. And so, um, but this one was, this was a pretty intense opportunity to uh, upgrade my way of working with it. So I didn't feel um, terrified going in, although I, of course, I felt that way. But, but you know, I went in with a, with the feeling that that we had people in this team who were extremely creative. And rather than channeling their creativity toward a goal, a shared goal, they were focusing on each other in a pretty destructive way. So it was messy, to say the least. And so I thought to myself, well, if I can take that same creative energy and redirect it towards something that they can all agree to work on. Keep in mind, this team had had a manager every six months. I mean, there were a lot of forces that were working against stability for this, this group of people. And so that was the approach I took. And yes, we made it through the two and a half days. So no problem there. So that's just to give you an idea of how to how, what I want to do with you today. So obviously what happens then is when you avoid conflict, you make more of it. And, and that's because there's a need to express. Uh, there's a fear of doing so. Um, and cutting through all of that takes real serious leadership. And, and again, that's why I appreciate um, you know, those of you who've shown up are obviously ready for those more sophisticated skills because these this that's what it calls for. It calls for a higher higher level of mastery overall. Um, when you're working with conflict, if you look at the energy alone, if you just look at energy as the force, and by the way, you know, some people say hear the word energy and they think woo-woo or new age. No, energy in physics is the ability to get work done. It it's the fuel. It's what gets you up in the morning. It's what allows you to get out of bed and go to work each morning. And by the end of the day, if you don't have any of it left, you don't feel like doing much. So that's the framework that we're using. What is going on with your energy? What is going on with the team's energy? Where are they placing their focus? Where are you placing your focus? And, and where is the organization looking? So this is all interrelated. Now, the Nautilus shell on the left in this slide uh, is, is a depiction or shows you the beauty of spire, energy spiraling in a creative way. Uh, the, the slide on the right is intended, the picture on the right is intended to show you what happens when people ignore conflict, they run from it, or just pretend it doesn't exist. The energy spirals down and it can get at a personal level. It can turn into depression at a team level. It's a dysfunctional team. And at an organizational level, it's a toxic workplace. So that's the, the, the framework that I'd like you to, to, to consider. When I came back, when we were in uh, Boston, there was a, a researcher from Oxford who was listing the kinds of things that were showing up in the tension between introducing mob programming, which is one single goal, create code for a client and do it in a team, and traditional management beliefs and assumptions. And so this is a, a snapshot of some of those things that, that create conflict in teams and organizations. And as I said, all you have to do is introduce something that conflicts with the existing familiar practices that are designed for stability, not for change. And you, <laughs> you're on your way. So agile and traditional management practices is is a good example of that. Okay, I'm not hearing anything from anybody. So I'm going to carry on and trust that when we get to oh I see we've lost Kelly on the table just saying look this needs you know and put the whole thing. Uh, someone put something out and, and, and the conflict was out in the open and, and then they could talk about it. So it, it, this is one of those things where it takes a brave leader to, to put it forward and uh, get the whole thing started. But it also means you have the skills to work with it because it's like standing in a storm. You, 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 you want to be able to recognize this is about the issue. It's not about the people and the emotions are Okay, I see a lot of other things here, and I appreciate that. Uh, responsibility being a key thing. Uh, that is probably 
the 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 aspect of that's most pertinent in all of this is accepting responsibility for what happens and the skills I'm going to get to that uh, so so hang on for that I'm just going to close that now that I've successfully opened that I'm very excited with my pleased with myself actually <laughs> I hope that helped and I hope you can hear me is there a way of finding out Just going to put it in the chat pane to ask you if you can hear me, and I'd appreciate some feedback. Possible. Just to make sure that's not an issue. Okay, beauty. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I hope some of those answers resonated. What we're really looking at here is developing your capacity in your leadership role as a decision maker. I don't care what role you were in in the organization. It doesn't matter. Um, but it, it, it's developed the empathy to see with the eyes of another, listen with the ears of someone else and feeling with the heart. You know, what what's that person feeling? And I'll give you some principles at the end of our conversation today that you can use as mastery level metrics, if you will. So that's what what you're looking at doing and with that empathy then you're able to recognize what these dynamics are made of why when is someone feeling safe if there, there's a lot of nuance in this you know when is someone feeling you know acting out because it's the safety issue they're not feeling emotionally or psychologically safe or when are they acting out because they're scared of losing approval or when are they, so so this is not about therapy, it's not about psychoanalysis, no. It's simply about compassion, about being able to see with heart and, and, and feeling. And I know that for some people is a freaky thing, but it is a most powerful way to work with conflict because it turns those negatives into positives. It turns those downward spirals and reverses them upward. And I'm glad to see we have PLE back, so that's exciting. I, I look for an Indian, uh, an Indian superhero to give you a, <laughs> a way of seeing this, and I, ho I hope this is appropriate for you and, and works. Uh, but this is the character that came up, because the two fundamental skills that you use is, is bringing in a, a piece in the heart which, if I understand this character accurately, this character had capacity, you know, did a lot of meditation. When you focus on something really intently, you can lose track of what's going on on the outside. Organizationally, an organization loses its focus when it spends 100% or even 80% of its time thinking short term and rooted in the past. So. That's where the selective and also focused on profit because then you ignore everything else. So, so uh, that's a way. That's how that particular slide uh, applies. To to work your way out of conflict, I'm giving you a few uh, opportunities. These, these come from a book called Conversational Intelligence by Judith Glazer. She's done some great work on neuroscience. And these are what I would, you know, these are brain friendly questions. Uh, in other words, they don't trigger uh, the, the cave brain that where people get scared. So the questions you can always put on the table, meaning it's wise to do so, are what assumptions do we have in place? Uh, sorry, I'm just seeing a note from Bella here. What assumptions are holding the place? How can we build trust in the situation? What led you to this belief? And you know, if I just use the last one, what led you to this belief? Uh, maybe not when you'd want to ask management, but the big belief in mob programming is that is that five people aren't as effective as one person. Uh, but so that's an assumption, actually. If I roll back, that's an assumption. At any rate, you can see you can use these. It's a number. Of of other questions, but it's the nature of these questions that's important. It's these are what, how kinds of questions. They're exploratory. They're not coming to any preconceived ideas about the answer. So, and then you can move on to finding new answers. So, if we have everyone supporting us, what could we do? What would a significant breakthrough look like for this team? Uh, what questions should we ask ourselves to move from where we are now to something more positive? 
how can we widen what we're seeing? What things are we leaving out that we need to bring into the equation? These are the kinds of questions that you can put forward into a team. Of course, adapt them to fit. Don't ever have an answer to the question. Otherwise, you already, you know, you're asking a leading question. There's a saying I was reading in a book by um, Adam Grant called, which basically goes, you can have very strong, strong opinions, but loosely held. And I think that's a very accurate um, way of seeing things. So now we're getting into skills that scale. And uh, skills that scale are skills that, that um, when you work with them at a personal level and you work with them at a team level, they, they follow you throughout your career. So uh, by the end of this part, I'm going to be able to give you the two skills that research has shown run from wherever you're at now, right the way through to the C-suite, if that's where you are, then it gives you a clarity of focus. So these are skills that scale from wherever you are now throughout your career. So let me go to this question here. What do you see as blocking the flow of teamwork in your organization? Is it what's being measured? Is it how communication flows? Is it fear of losing something, which is uh, where my question box went? Oh, nuts. I may not be able to ask you that because I can't see a question box anymore. Oh, I'll try that. Okay. Yes, exactly. In terms of agile transformation, middle-level managers think agile transformation may act negatively to lose their jobs. That is a security, as you know. That's a security question. And 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 what what what's helpful to illustrate or understand here is that the big assumption you're running into when managers are threatened by anything new and unfamiliar is that they're going to lose control. And when they fear, people fear losing control, they, they do difficult, they do, do very challenging things that obviously increases the amount of conflict and tension in the workplace. But the trick here is that when you have a, a, agility, in organizational response, in your personal self, when you have agility, you gain greater control over uncertainty and over the surprises that are showing up in the world today. But however, I've also been in a number of situations where one person's vision has a completely different meaning than the other person's vision. And so this is the area where powerful questions come to mind, where asking questions, doing some exploratory discovery kind of work can help illuminate what is the motivation. And if there is a, a vision missing, I mean, my way of operating in my career has always been wherever there's a gap, you get to fill it. There's a lot of opportunity there. Yes, yeah, so going back to the questions, want skills, there was, you need to handle conflict effectively in a constructive manner. Observe the energy. Where is it going? Where is it flowing? If you can, detect the source, but ask questions. Those were those discovery questions I gave you earlier. And uh, also you can do another thing. You can reframe, you can redirect, you can refocus. So those are those are um, uh, more. And I see what is being measured. <laughs> that is probably the easiest place to make a difference is to change what's being measured so it's more effective and fits. Now in, in mod programming, here's the experience. The beliefs and assumptions, five can't be more effective than one. It actually is, and uh, but that's not the belief. And I've actually done a program on this that I, when I came out of the conference. I did a program on this, a podcast. I'll give you that link in a second because you'll you'll hear their experience and perhaps you can draw something from what they did over to your world and apply it. Um, oops, hang on. I just got to go back to this. All right. So and then. Show me the cost benefits, then I'll believe. I, I, in my experience, facts never really do it. it. Everybody says, show me the facts, and then I'll believe it. No, it, it, the belief is the one that drives everything. So if, if they can come and sit down with you, if, you can, if, if people who seem to be on the other side, per se, can be welcomed in and invited in, and you keep that open, uh, you've got a much better chance. But the, these are, you know, the, these assumptions. And then the, the last one is willingness to try something different. In other words, give it some time to try experiment. And failure is learning. 
I know that's a hard one because failure in the world of perfection and Six Sigma, uh, Six Sigma is probably one of the best ways to defeat innovation possible. But in the world of that, uh, willingness to try something different has, has got a pretty high risk. In the case of the ClearLink, which is the podcast I'm referring to, they took the credit card and went out and bought a TV. That was, uh, <laughs> and they bought a year of time. And they said, look, just give us a year. And, that, and their, organized, their company went for that because they knew they needed to do something different. They just weren't sure what. And this was what they started with. So there's the show. I have a podcast. I've been running podcasts for 10 years. Uh, this is on my new podcast, which I started in the fall of 2016. It's on ClearLink. It's episode 42. Um, and that's the link to it. And I, you'll, you'll get a lot of, of I, I hope you'll get a lot of insight and some ideas from there. So moving from conflict to collaboration is, it was without question, uh, both mastery and it is uh, practice. So if you're not used to asking questions before you jump to conclusion, you will need to be mindful enough to stop yourself from just going into an automatic response and to ask an open question to explore and discover instead. This is where the leadership comes forward in, in a big way. Uh, if you are not comfortable with listening, you know, without having a whole bunch of things running through your mind, then you, you will need to calm, calm your mind, to just open your mind and allow people to say what they need to say. So that's where it starts on a personal level. At a, at a team level, you are very much looking for where's the focus? Is it on each taking each other out and, and the goal is missing? These are the kinds of observational questions that you want to ask yourself. So it is about practice. It's about identifying your starting point, each of you, no matter where you are in the process. And I no, this may be challenging. If you want to move from conflict to collaboration, you, you really have to step into the uh, higher skill sets. So these are the collaboration skills teams and, and managers uh, right the way through to C-suite share and of course what's interesting about this set of skills this is research that comes from success finder they did a webinar that i attended uh, called ladders of leadership uh, sometimes the conflict arises due to political influence <laughs> now by that if you can clarify political influence being internal political influence. Um, if it's internal political influence, that's always a signal that you're in a, uh, you're going to have a more of a, hmm, let's say your power is going to be centralized. Uh, you're dealing with the assumption that knowledge is power so that the, the, the things will be withheld and centralized. These, these, that's how that works. And so if you can, uh, I mean, these are really tricky because this is the whole organizational ambient, the whole organizational environment. And, and what you're attempting to do is to see what is the political agenda going on here and what's that going to do to anything that you try to do where you are in, you know, depending on your position in the organization and, and the initiative that you're bringing forward. Because uh, I did a lot of work, as I've said at the beginning, in the policy arena. I spent some time working uh, with a lot of like big P political uh, influence, so to speak, and and I learned a lot from that. And, and what I learned is that if you can follow where that's going, you've got a better chance of positioning what you're doing so that you can move forward in it. Uh, that's the best I can do without getting into the details and reading more clearly what, what you're what you're handling there. Um, I don't quite understand the question about coach or change agent. 
uh, I think you know, if you're asking about what my background is on that, I think it's called being thrown under the fire multiple times, and I'm still standing. So, uh, and I'm very excited about that. So, <laughs> I don't know if that helps or not. Um, okay, how can we handle conflicts due to team merging synergy issues? The 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 place that I took a lot of of, of knowledge from on this comes from South Africa, and and there was a game called Know Me, and it's a very personal kind of a game which sort of said who are you really and it was it was one where uh, black and white would be put together of course you can just imagine they did not get along there was a lot of tension a lot of a problem with that and they the kinds of questions they tell me more tell me I, I need to understand this what what else is, is so so you can hear by the flavor of those kinds of questions that were in this game that the language of agile and the language of traditional management is very different. And so I'm going to use the one that I like the most because it's a, it's a big shift in the brain thing. But traditional management talks about cost cutting all the time. They want to save, cost, you know, cost cut. But on the agile side, you can say we can save costs. You know, so, so you can just flip it to a more positive framework. And it's more brain friendly. It's It, it tends to focus people more positively and you get better things out of there. But you're, I would just start by being able to observe what these conflicts are and what the response is to them at this point in time. And then look where you can redirect the conflict into something better. So your skill sets are reframing, uh, you know, agile in the language of something, you know, of, of traditional. Uh, redirecting the, the conflict into something more useful, some some goal orientation that let's try this for a year is what ClearLink did. So yeah, a number of different ways of working with it, but that's, uh, you basically need to be very clear on what's the source of this conflict. And it, if it's resistance, it's because it's a failure to communicate and make the, make the territory safe. <laughs> problems with age old, that's a wonderful question. How do you deal with problems age old when you're new to the organization? You know, one of the most overlooked opportunities is to take people who are new to the organization and say, look, culturally, we've got, tell us what you see. Because what happens is that people get so deeply rooted in decisions inside their company. It's a pattern. It's a path. It's like a, uh, a, a, a road that's been muddy and people go down it and everybody gets stuck in that in the same rut. And so if you can make a, a list of those patterns and and you will it makes the decisions predictable for one uh, that how to deal with them is a whole other matter because that is a leadership question and it is one of readiness and it is one of of bold and courage and the best thing you can do at this point is just make you know take a lot of notes on what these patterns are and what the impact is on the organizational growth at some point you're going to have an opportunity i hope to put that into play so thank you for that that's a great question a lot of pressure from top management pushing more work during sprints to satisfy clients how do you handle it i, I i'd like to think that results are are uh, valued in in some way, and I, I think the question is sometimes it's a matter of, of pushing back to say to look with results and quality. So you're going to have to experiment with that one because the character of your management will be different in every environment that that we have here on this list. Uh, but it's it's um, you know that that yeah. So I I would try that. I would try pushing back a bit if you can do that. And if you find that too too scary, um, you're gonna find yourself dealing with the same pattern over and over again. And so it does take leadership, no question. It's probably not a big help, but. All right, there's a long question here that I think is better asked, answered. Um, um, I appreciate the detail, but I think I'm gonna have to answer that one in a, in a blog or something. In general, conflicts are good or bad. That's an observation of some sort. Um, well, they can result in going up, which is good. That was the image I gave you with the Nautilus. And bad means it spirals down. So bad, you know, I, it's much better to get rid of the value judgment and just look at 
where's this energy going and how do we redirect it? Go deeper than the value judgment is what I would suggest there. Is conflict an impediment in agile products? I prefer to think that conflict is, an, is, is really diversity coming into play and that makes a better product. It always makes a, a better product. You'll hear the developer on the interview I did say, look, you know, I have good ideas, I have bad ideas, and I, I don't know the difference until I table them in front of my people, you know, my teammates. Now, to that, him or her, uh, that may seem like, you know, if somebody says, well, I think your idea, that doesn't work for me, or that idea is, not you know, not a great one, or it doesn't work, it's his way of balancing it back. It's how that happens. So conflict can actually be uh, a, a, a positive for getting higher performance in agile because you're, you're looking at how do we work with these diverse perspectives. Diverse teams perform better. Overall, they are much more resilient. And so you wanna use that conflict to gain higher performance. Influence can also contribute to conflicts. It depends on the kind of influence, the source of it. Um, again, you're looking at what kind of influence is coming, what, what's the focus of this, what's the purpose of it. Very hard for me to answer that question with a bit more detail. Yes, exactly. The observation conflicts are bound to happen, human emotions are involved, how we deal with it is more important. It is the pivotal factor. And, and so it, this is where having compassion uh, for the human condition, having empathy for what's going on, but not getting sucked into that vortex of <laughs> whatever negativity is going on, but simply take it and refocus it. That's, that's the skill set, and it takes a lot of practice. Yeah, management puts a lot of pressure on teams to give an exact release date as soon as the requirements are given without any room for analysis. Uh, that's something, you, this is where you're feeling their pressure. And if you can find a way to step, it's, this is where the empathy comes in. If you can find a way to sort of say, I can see you're under a lot of pressure for an, a date, and then find a way to say, you know, it, can, we, can we do it this way? Can we approach it this way? Will that ease the pressure off of you? And so in other words, so it doesn't become a reaction to, to the pressure, it becomes proactive in terms of easing the pressure. I know that's subtle, but I hope that helps. <laughs> How do you handle an overseas boss who says Amer Indians are not problem solvers? And, oh, uh, you know, that's a complete lack of empathy. So, uh, and, and I, 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 I feel for you in that environment. Um, yeah, because you're comparing across cultures and that never ends well. It's never useful either. So I would offer that, you know, in terms of how do you respond to that, how do you handle an overseas boss who keeps saying Indians are not problem solvers, Americans are, I think, I think it's, it's worth responding that, that Indians have, have bring, bring not only, I mean, look at your culture overseas in Canada where I am, incredible at construction, incredible creative, high tech that, you know, you, you know, you've got a corner on the tech market, you're doing extremely well there. So I, I think that the idea of that judgment, if you can just simply not respond to it and or come back with the, the positives of what Indians are without saying what Americans aren't because that's just completely silly. Anyway, sorry. I don't know what else to do with that one. Any tips and tricks to manage conflict in organizations? You're always looking there for where in the metrics intersecting and trying to push things in one way when they're meant to go another. So again, good example is uh, you're asking for a team performance, but you're measuring and rewarding individual performance. Uh, you're, you're rewarding shareholder value, and in order to do that, the pressure's being put on the organization to do things that aren't going to help the overall organization as a whole. So you're always looking for, this is where your observation skills are kept critical, observe where these conflicts are coming from and, and what's behind them, look behind them, keep looking behind them. I hope that helps. And that's the list of questions I see. Kelly, do you have anything else? Uh, apart from that super long one, 
which I will try to copy. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, there's another one there. How can you resolve conflicts without affecting relationships? Pretty much impossible. Uh, how do you deal with leaders, managers who do not want to change? There'll be a fear there, and the resistance will simply be of who am I when when this is all over? Will I be losing something or gaining something? And so this is a communication opportunity to, to be honest and blended with a lot of compassion. You will, when you resolve conflicts, you will always affect relationships and the preferably for the better. So it, it is all that's where the compassion comes in. That's where the understanding comes in. It doesn't mean you're going to have it's going to work every time, um, but it does mean that you you are looking to improve the, inter, the the relationships because that's where everything starts. Yeah, so I hope that helps. And thanks again. Kelly? Yeah, I think we are done. And uh, yes, we have done it by our predefined time only. So uh, thank you, friends. Uh, thank you for joining us. And sorry for the technical inconvenience we had today. And uh, regarding the SU and PDU, all the information, this session will uh, get you one SU and one PDU. You will get one follow-up email after one hour of uh, this session. And if you have any follow-up questions, you will get one thread of our discussion forum. So all the queries you have, you can post on that thread and uh, later on Den, uh, Donna can uh, take care of those uh, questions. So uh, anything from your side, Donna, uh, before we... Uh, uh, no, I think that says it rather well. I just want to thank you for your help at, uh, at this. And, and actually now I'm more confident that I can push these buttons and have good things happen. Um, <laughs> And thanks to all the participants for your question, your contribution, your participation. I, re I really appreciate it. And for the lovely feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, good night. Good night.